Welcome to the Mighty Dragon. I was joined on the podcast on St. Patrick's Day by my good friend Andrew Froning. He brought along his colleagues from the Dress Code movie, director Joseph Papello and lead actor Gerard Guerrilli. A mobster movie, but with a twist, and that twist being that it's not quite a typical mobster movie at all. It explores a child and then a man's deep secret within this macho, intimidating environment. I truly enjoyed this film, and gentlemen, I wish you all the very best with it. Hello, dress code crew! <laughs> I can't Hello, get my words you. out! <laughs> Happy St. Patrick's Day to you all. Congratulations on Dress Code Movie, which I watched last night, which I absolutely loved. And I'm so glad that you've joined me on the podcast today to talk about it, your latest movie. But first of all, would you like to introduce yourselves and just tell us a bit more about your involvement in the movie and your background in film? And if we go, Gerard, Joseph and Andrew. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Victoria. Uh, my name's Gerard Gorilli. I'm an actor. Uh, I've been at this now for over 10 years, and I am the executive producer and lead actor of Dress Code. I play Bobby Russo. All right. Joseph? Hi. Uh, again, thank you for having us. Um, I'm the director of Dress Code. Um, I'll give you a, a quick little uh, background on myself. Me and my, uh, my childhood friend, the writer of Dress Code, uh, Peter Panagas, who couldn't join us today. Um, we started Orwell Productions back in about 2012 just before entering pre-production on our first film, uh, Love in a Coffee Shop. Basically, we were two kids that were just enamored with like with film. And and uh, as we got older, we were we became more interested in, in how they were made and kind of went into storytelling. Fast forward, uh, we, we met Gerard and there it is. And uh, next thing you know, we, uh, we have dress code. Fantastic. Andrew. <laughs> We've yeah. spoken quite a few times, haven't we? Uh, once or twice, once or <laughs> twice. But I'm always happy to be back and happy to speak with you and bring my friends this time around. Um, yes. I'm Andrew Froning. I'm the director of photography of Dress Code. I'm also the editor of Dress Code. Um, we had a lot of we had a lot of fun making this thing. Mm. So we're glad you enjoyed it. Absolutely, I did. Gerard, as Bobby Russo, what research did you do before portraying Bobby? Well, we had the screenplay pretty much done in 2020 and that's when we were supposed to film it but uh, for obvious reasons we had to uh pause production so i knew the script through thick and thin for about over a year that we started november 8th 2021 so i knew the script very well and i was very influenced by uh i'm not sure if you're familiar with this film or, or this actor but uh it's a film called normal and it stars uh tom wilkinson so i watched that at least three or four times to like really get a feel for it because one, he's a tremendous actor and two, his storyline is very similar to Bobby Russo as he's very tortured and miserable because he wants to portray himself as a woman. He feels comfortable in his own skin. And I was just like, this is amazing. So if we could tie this story into a, like a mob generated film based in New Jersey, which we did, I was like, this could work, but it has to be done right because it was a slippery slope. The subject matter and the characters was very slippery. But with Andrew and Joe and Pete's script, I felt like it really worked. And when the words flow and the script flows, the acting just kind of comes naturally. The story flips back to the 90s. And I identified quite a few items in young Bobby's room uh, denoting this. Are there any challenges when you're filming outside when filming in the past? You know, it, it, it can be very complicated, especially if you're a, a stickler for uh, for catching these little things in, in films. Um, I think we decided pretty early on that we would get the shots that we needed and and we, we would try not to focus on what's happening in the background or anything like yeah. that. So, if there were like newer cars and stuff like that. So we, we early on, we kind of like, this is what we can do. You know, we, we, we couldn't, uh, you know, we didn't have the budget to shut down streets and, and get cars in there. Right. So, uh, but I, I think it worked out pretty well. Uh, nothing really pops out too crazy. And then also you mentioned the room, which is, which is yeah. funny because I know in, 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 especially with the three of us here, uh, we're, we're kind of big nerds and, and we, we've held on to, <laughs> the nineties nostalgia and, and whether that be with toys or, or, uh, or my Power Ranger posters. And <laughs> so, 
uh, we 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 were planning our whole life to uh, to make a '90s movie. I guess not realizing it. So um, you kept all your all your stuff from the '90s in the garage or up in the loft, and that's it. <laughs> Well, my parents were happy to, to for me to come and get them from their attic, some stuff. All oh, right, yes. <laughs> they won't take oh. it back, though. <laughs> yeah, they're like, you can keep that now. <laughs> but it, it, it's it's funny. It worked out, you know, uh, it, it, you know, in the in the movie, Young Bobby, uh, Nicholas, uh, who did a great job, we, like, there's a scene where he's listening to his disc man. And, you know, he's a young kid. He had no idea what to do with this contraption. Uh, you know, we were filming a scene and he, you know, the direction was basically, oh, you're going to take the headphones off quickly. And he didn't know what that meant. You know, he's in a world of, of ear pods. Yeah. So he's not taking it off. I'm like, no, just drop it. Put it on your shoulders. It's cool. He's like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Oh, yeah. my God. So uh, yeah. So there was some some stuff like that with uh, with Nicholas, which was really funny, but he was a great kid. So it worked out. It's crazy, isn't it? I, I have this with my daughter. We have the red telephone boxes out here and there's still some in some villages and she's like what's that for and it's like well this is how people used to make phone calls believe it or not so it's crazy isn't it um Andrew what's the story all about well the story it was it's very interesting and um not your typical mobster movie I think is the best way to put it uh the first time I read the script by Peter Panagos I was like I was blown away because I, I was expecting one thing. And while it delivered on a lot of those tropes of you know the mob and it had to do with family, you know, it had to do with a single character trying to make his way up through the ranks. It felt like something we had seen before, but then there's just this underlying story um, beneath the whole thing. You know, you see Bobby as a young child growing up with his domineering father and his loving mother, and they're trying to, you know, they're just they're good, bad, good, bad. But, you know, there's the nature and nurture that is instilled in Bobby when he grows up. Um, and then just Bobby has his own secret, his own thing going on. So he's he wrestles with that for most of his life. It's really interesting to see that in a mob film where Italian-Americans are very, very traditional. And, you know, this is what you are. This is what you be. No deviations from that. So it's interesting to see. A 21st century take. I think the the father of uh, young Bobby was just absolutely terrifying. I think if I met him, if I was visiting New Jersey, I'd be utterly terrified. <laughs> I was just it's exactly what I think of a mobster that that voice and the mannerism and everything about him. This macho guy. Freddie is the most pleasant man like you'll ever meet. So like I like, get like really intense for a scene and then the next minute he'll be like oh do you guys like that take like so pleasant yeah. like you know freddie is in my <laughs> one of the best actors i've ever worked with there's a scene later in the film that i feel was just like like i became better uh working with him because it was such an intense scene and we just you know we knew our lines and we just fed off each other and i think i became a better actor because of freddie so i'm glad you feel like that he's so terrifying because that's what we wanted to portray for, uh, for him on screen. And I think it really showed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Honestly, I thought he was wonderful. Sorry, Joseph. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, a lot, a lot of the actors, Freddie and especially Frank, they, they just elevated everyone in the scenes with them. Every, they just, the way they, they pulled everyone in, especially with Gerard and, and Fred, the scene that he's, he's talking about, I believe it's just, they both elevated each other and it worked out so well. And he is, he is the sweetest guy. It's so funny. You know, he'll, yeah. he'll say a scene, he'll be yelling and screaming, and then he'll just like look at us and just start laughing at us. So, like, it's, it's just <laughs> very interesting. Sir. That's an amazing disconnect from your character. I oh, often yeah. say to actors, like, how do you chill out after playing such an intense character? Um, so he obviously can immediately. So that's pretty cool. It's impressive. It's really impressive. You, you know, uh, he could just turn it, turn it on and off like that. It's, it, it is very impressive. Yes. A lot of years practice, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. When we're talking about iconic mobster movies and series such as Goodfellas, um, The Godfather, Sopranos and all of that, what can you do as artists to make your story unique? You know, I think we all agreed early on uh, in this process that, you know, we wanted to take what we've seen in those those specific examples that you gave. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of uh, the movie Donnie Brasco as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
it, and, and I really like that movie because it it seems a little bit more based in in more of a realistic, you know, it doesn't really glorify it. It's actually the opposite. It actually shows how sad it is, that movie. And that's kind of where I was thinking my head was at when we were we were kind of working on this and pre-production stuff. But but we wanted we wanted to show that, hey, we know the cliches. We get it. Um, <laughs> and, but, you know, we, so we want to give that to the audience. We wanted to let them know, hey, we did the research. We know what happens. We know this works. We've been researching our whole lives by accident. But we wanted to use those cliches and kind of disguise this unique uh, this unique situation, uh, and 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 it's honestly it becomes a very timely conversation. Uh, you know, in 2023, this is you know it, it definitely fits in what a lot of people are going through in the world, and it's you know it's out there more now. But that was it. We wanted to to kind of take that, show like, hey, yeah, it's it's the movie you think it is, but it's really not going where you think it's going to go. So Absolutely. That was overall, I I really. What you said, Andrew, was true for me. Like, it wasn't the typical mob film. I said to my husband, oh, we've got this mob film to watch tonight. And and I, we were both, oh, and then the story went elsewhere. So that was quite surprising and refreshing, actually. But it just seems so right in that sort of family environment for this to happen as well. Obviously, with this type of um, subject, there will be guns on set. What are the considerations for you with guns? Yeah, that, that's a great question. They didn't fire in any way. They were rubber, <laughs> um, which is something. And look, this is before, you know, the current conversation with happened with, you know, with, with the, the movie recently. But to be extra safe and because I'm I'm very cautious with this stuff, I, I kept the guns under lock and key when we weren't filming. Uh, we decided day one that that we would try our best not to focus heavily on the violence visually, obviously, with the subject matter. You yeah. know, there needs to be some, but we tried to to be clever with with the way it was shot, and then also the way you know Andrew had to work his magic in the editing room to make it make it work. But we tried our best to to be clever with it and not just show brutal violence at, at all times. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to ask from paper to filming, how long was that process? Well, we started uh, November eighth, twenty twenty one. Like I said before. And we finished, I want to say, a week before the Super Bowl, which was February of 2022. Yeah. Uh, and we added the graveyard scene and we reshot a scene on the train tracks in June. So it really went from November to June. And then we locked picture, I want to say, around Halloween, Joe, Andrew? That yeah. Sounds about right. Yeah. I think, you know, it wasn't consecutive days, uh, but I so probably like about a month in total like but not con you know not consistent days but yeah yeah do you, do you know um days. sorry do you know how long it took the writer to write the script pete pete's pete's funny uh <laughs> he actually writes pretty quickly so the first draft was super fast i mean probably a month tops maybe oh no he's the writer yeah. i want to be <laughs> yeah he, 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 he's great with it you know and then you know what it is he'll write he'll write a first draft and i know he will stop he won't look at it for a bit and then he'll you know maybe have a little glass of scotch sit down calmly and then just kind of go on that second draft and just co completely rewrite it sometimes but he yeah pretty quick he pete is i don't know how he does it He's very quick at those initial drafts and coming up with the story and stuff. It's, it's very good. Pete's a great writer. He always has been. I always must been. get him on here sometime to talk to him about his process. I really enjoyed the music choices and placement. And who chose that music? Uh, so, I mean, the, so the score was composed by uh, the incredible Stefan Swanson. Gerard had worked with him in the past. Just phenomenal. I worked closely with him, kind of determining the best feel for the music, the type of music, and, and kind of what we were looking for, what scenes we wanted to really focus on. But yeah, we were very, uh, you know, we were very lucky finding him. And then we were super lucky that Gerard has a, a, a singer songwriter in the family with uh, Lisa and uh, H. Kink. So they were kind enough to let us use a couple of of songs uh, for the film, and it. I mean, it helped shape the scenes that it was using. So there's the 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 club scene where 
where the music is just takes over the scene and and Andrew's visuals with it were it was phenomenal. It really worked out. So yeah, I love the music. I just thought it was just perfect for those scenes, and it really stuck out to me. Gerard, you portrayed Bobby's secret with so much respect, and I feel the whole story was very touching and moving. How did you feel when you filmed your secret? Well, in New Jersey, New York, there's always this one November really hot day. Yeah. There's always one. There's always one. And then the next day it goes to like five degrees. So as as luck would have it, it was one of the really hot days in November. And it was really hot, like really, really warm. And again, I was portraying a character and uh, in very unfamiliar territory for me. But so I was very nervous. But Joe and Andrew are such professionals and they calmed me down. And, uh, you know, we walked through the scene. They knew Andrew and Joe both knew the vision. I knew the vision. And as a collaborative unit, I think we handled it with such delicacy and, and, and such professionalism. And I just hope that the right person sees it and realizes what we were trying to portray story wise. Yes, absolutely. I thought it was just done so sensitively and very respectful. So, um, yeah, that was very touching, that scene. Another couple of scenes that really stood out to me were the camera angles around the card table and in the group huddle in the garden outside the funeral. Are these the type of camera angles chosen so you feel a, a part of that intense conversation they were having, like you're one of the crew? Yeah. Um, yeah, Andrew, definitely. Andrew. It was all Andrew for this, uh, that scene. <laughs> Uh, yeah, those scenes, they they were all about and I, the way everything was written and the way Joe had explained it to me as far as directing, like you want it to be in a real conversation and you this guy steps on this guy's lines and this guy steps on this guy's lines. So when I'm primarily handheld, I think during those scenes, I really wanted to be almost like a floating person in the room as if you were just somebody in the background, just looking around in the poker table, looking at everybody's cards, you know, getting everybody's point of view. And it was tricky sometimes to, to, to get to the right place, to get the right angle on the right person. And then knowing it had to be edited and this shot that I thought was great may not work because everything, yeah, it's a puzzle at that point, but yeah, we, we shot it so that you felt like a participant. You felt like you were there and hopefully it did feel that way. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There were some standout scenes for me. As the person who has guessed the twist in everything, I failed to get the twist in this film. My husband did, which was really even more annoying. And I was so focused on Bobby's secret. That's why. Congratulations. Uh, was the <laughs> twist always going to be this one or was it changed at the last minute? Or was it already scripted that way? So it was generally the twist was the twist. Um, it, it was it was planned out that way. Uh, I know Pete and I had made those decisions pretty early on. Um, we we really wanted to make sure that we we pulled the focus in a certain direction, and and then be able to throw something at the audience that they weren't they weren't expecting. So right. even before we we had an ending, that was always the plan. And it's the plan, honestly, with the entire movie, you know, like, like we said earlier, you know, we wanted people to think it's, it, they're watching a mob movie, you know, a typical mob movie. Yeah. And it's totally, you know what, you're not going to expect what's coming next. You're not going to, you're not going to see it coming. So, yeah. So it was, it was initially, by the time we got to the writing that scene to make sure it was final, yeah, it was, it was already done. Um, and that's just Pete's, again, Pete's phenomenal writing. And again, it goes to the acting Andrew's editing, his camera work, like everything, everything just happened to fall into place perfectly. So that was great. It, it kind uh-huh. of had the real mob theme ending, didn't it? And I want to add too that there are there are definitely hints and and plenty of foreshadowing, but I think it's just the fact that it's a mob film that you're just yep. not you're not anticipating where the story is is going to go and where the story's logical conclusion is. Yeah, absolutely. What's the enduring fascination of mob? stories and films this is gerard's this is definitely gerard's <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I grew up with it you know uh my dad showed me the godfather i want to say at eight or nine years old you know <laughs> I, I mean that little <laughs> so, you see uh goodwill hunting at like maybe 10 or 11 years old <laughs> you know it's it's just it's just that i grew up with it you know and 
a lot of these movies resonate with people. I feel like mob stories are always going to be in style as long as they're done originally. And yeah. with, uh, you know, and I think, you know, with dress code, that's what we, I, I'm very confident that's what we portrayed. But yeah, I just grew up with it, you know, and, and that's really what it is. And I never really did a mob film. I did a movie in 2013 called Fratello, which means brother in Italian, but it wasn't really a mob film. So this was definitely our first crack at it. And, uh, you know, it, it, everything just came together so, so naturally. You know, I'm so grateful for Joe and Andrew. Actually, real quick story about how I met Andrew. So one of the characters, Chris Arangio, he plays Vinny, one of the uh, knock around guys, I guess you could yeah. say. His short film screened on the same block as my last film in 2019. So I met Chris there and I said, Chris, who shot your film? Who shot this? He's like, oh, his name's Andrew Froning. Uh, you got to meet him. He's really talented. So I kept him in mind. And then once we finalized dress code, me, Joe and Pete, I was like, we got to we got to give Andrew a call. Let, let's see. Like this, his films are shot very beautifully. And Andrew is yeah. so talented. I'm not just saying that to say it. I say it from my heart and I say it from my gut because he's terrific. And this film would not have gotten done without Andrew. So very proud. Andrew, how'd you follow with that up? Oh, well, I <laughs> say thank you um, to Gerard and to my, to my good friend, Chris, and to Joe and Pete, you know, the dress code team for seeing something in my work that I could bring to this project. And um Going back to the last question, I got to say, I, one of the things that I really liked was they weren't just remaking Goodfellas or The Godfather. It was yeah. the mob as it, if it exists today, it wasn't this big, you know, the mob's on top and nobody can mess with the mob. It, it was really like the decline of yeah. organized crime in, in our in our current world, um, which, which attracted me to the project. I always like doing things that are, that are very different. And I know some of the camera angles I suggested to Joe were probably not the first thing that anyone would have thought of, but you know, that's, that's my window into, um, into that world. So I, I think it was just a very good match. So when can we see the movie? We're, we're uh, film, film festivals right now. It's it's been accepted into uh, a few already. There's a lot more coming, hopefully. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, definitely we we want to get it out as soon as possible. So uh, we're waiting on a few more film festivals uh, to to basically determine what we're going to do. We might have a few more premieres. We've been this, uh, not premieres. We ha might have a few more screenings uh, locally in this area, um, and then hopefully, you know, we get it on streaming yeah. at some point in the very near future because there are a lot of people. Who, uh, who want to see it. And uh, absolutely. Very excited. <laughs> Congratulations to you all. It was such an amazing film. I loved it so much. What What are you all up to next? What's your next projects? Or can you say, is that secret? <laughs> I think uh, I think we could we could talk about. It. I mean, Andrew is constantly doing a million things at once. Yes. <laughs> so that's always awesome. <laughs> He's always busy. But I mean, we're we're talking right now. We're working on a, another project. All of us, same same team. So we're you know we're in the early stages though, in in you know what you would call pre production. But um, yeah, no, we're working on something uh, not not in the uh, mafia genre this yeah. time. But we're, we're going to mix it up a little bit, maybe something a little bit more suspense, uh, suspenseful. So, yeah, definitely uh, it's coming hopefully soon. We'll, uh, uh -huh. yeah, so it's being scripted right now. We'll Great. Keep me posted <laughs> and I'll Absolutely. pop it on my blog. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, ev all of you, for coming on to the Mighty Dragon podcast. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Hope you are going to be getting stuck into the Guinness. Oh, you know it. I'm no thinking everybody is not wearing green right now in his Zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> now you gonna... Patrick's Day too, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. We could have a drink today, right? We deserve it. I think you're allowed. <laughs> For sure. My For little sure. Italian daughter is wearing full green today, so. <laughs> <laughs> this is the one day when everybody's Irish. So. Yeah. Oh. We're Catholics. We're good Catholics, too. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> oh, thank you so much again, and hopefully see you back on the Mighty Dragon in the future. Best of luck with dress code. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. Know, you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.
you for having us.